Hi everyone and welcome to chapter 11 part 1c on the maturation and activation of T lymphocytes. I know last video was a bit much. This video will be easier once you get the concepts from last video. It is uh, some parts similar and some parts additional information. So maturation of T lymphocytes. Now lymphocytes are all made in the bone marrow before birth but T lymphocytes differ from B lymphocytes in the fact that it matures in the thymus gland. Now this thymus can string after puberty and this is why our immune system sort of goes downhill after we age, um, after puberty. Now T cell receptors, T cell also has receptors on its cell surface membrane. It is complementary with a specific antigen. One T cell, one type of receptor, one type of antigen. Now it's very similar in structure to antibodies, but it is not quite called the antibody receptor. So please be careful, T cell receptors are called T cell receptors, not antibody receptors. Now after maturation, only then it can circulate in the blood and lymph. Now after maturation, what happens? So, if the specific pathogens invade, what happens next is an antigen presentation cell formation first. The macrophage will engulf the pathogen and presents the antigens on the cell surface. Then, only the specific T lymphocytes which have receptors that is complementary to the antigen will be activated. So that particular type of T cell will be selected and activated. So this is called clonal selection. Right after that, they, it will divide by mitosis. And this is called clonal expansion. So the same type, okay, there are many types of T lymphocytes here. Only this type is complementary to the antigen presenting cell antigen here. Um, and you can see that it divides to many T cells of the same type. Only after that, it can develop into two types of cell, different here, T helper cell or T killer cell. Let's look at what T helper cells do first. Yeah. So T helper cells, they majorly function. The main function is to secrete cytokines. Cytokines are actually small hormone-like molecules, but we don't call it hormones, we call it cytokines. Another name for it is interleukins. And they do generally three things. They stimulate B cells, they stimulate macrophages, and stimulate killer T cells. T killer cells, killer T cells, same thing, okay? Now, so three things again. B cells, macrophages, and killer T cells. What does it stimulate it to do? It stimulates it to become more vigorous. So B cells that are stimulated will divide and develop into plasma cells and memory B cells. And this will result in increased antibodies level. So it sort of ramps up. It's like a booster. Okay? Stimulate macrophages. Um, this, this would stimulate macrophages to carry out phagocytosis more vigorously. So it does it faster, does it more. And t killer T cells which are stimulated would divide and produce more toxins as well. Okay, so the second function here of T helper cells though is to form T helper memory cells. And this is also in charge of secondary response and long-term immunity. We don't need to know any more detail of T helper memory cells. Let's talk about cytotoxic T killer cell. Now, as we said just now, it produces toxins. And that's why it's called cytotoxic, toxic to cells. So this is what it does. Number one, it seeks out infected host cells. This includes the antigen-presenting cells. This also includes cancer cells. Now, it's faulty infected host cells. Seek them out and it will destroy them. So how does it do that? Number one, it sort of attaches to the surface of cells first. Um, they do have some sort of a receptor to detect whether it's foreign or not then it punches holes into cells and then secrete toxins into cells 
It's sort of like throwing a grenade. So, what does it secrete into the cells? It secretes hydrogen peroxide sometimes, or sometimes perforin, which is another sort of chemical, in order to kill the cell. Now, what are the functions other than that? It forms killer T memory cells. So as we see here, helper cells, T helper memory cells, T killer cells, T killer memory cells. Again, it is involved in long term immunity and involved in enabling the secondary response of the body. Here's a summary of the immune response. This is what they expect you to write when they ask for a description of the immune response. The first step is always when the phagocyte engulfs the antigen. And this, after engulfment, this produces the antigen presenting cell, APC. Now the APC presents the antigen to lymphocytes, activating the humoral or antibody mediated immune response or the cell mediated immune response. Now the humoral or antibody mediated immune response is largely concerning B cells. Okay. And B cells here get activated and develop into plasma cells, which produces antibodies, and memory B cell, which is in charge of long-term immunity. Let's look at the cell-mediated immune response. The T cells, they're activated, okay, will produce T killer cells, and these T killer cells will um, secrete toxins into infected host cells and kill it or T helper cells which secrete cytokines now T helper cells will develop T helper memory cells whereas T killer cells will also develop into T killer memory cells so there are three types of memory cells here and each type of cell does different things now, these cell-mediated immune response and humoral immune response, they do not, um, they they are not independent from each other. They do communicate and work together. So here are some green arrows to show you how they work together. Let's talk about antibodies first. Antibodies, in many many mechanisms, um, they actually bind to the antigen and present it to the phagocyte in order for phagocytes to engulf more. B cells, which are activated by the APC here, can also become an APC. Cytokines that are secreted by T helper cell can stimulate the phagocyte to undergo phagocytosis more vigorously. It can stimulate the T killer cells to produce more toxins and it can stimulate the B cell in order to develop into more plasma cells to produce even more antibodies. So you can see here there is a lot of cross talking. There's not a lot of communication. There's a lot of working together in different processes to result in immune response and to protect your body against different pathogens. This is the last part of part one. Now the the idea of this part is really to say that hey now we know how the immune system works we actually can take or measure the different number of components in the blood and use that number to estimate to diagnose diseases or to assess success of treatments we usually measure in this unit numbers per millimeter cube of blood okay for example when there's an infection in your body your number of phagocytes increases, so if we take your blood, blood sample, we can centrifuge it at high speed, spin it at high speed, it will separate layers, and then we can test what is in each component, and we will see that, hey, number of B and T lymphocytes has increased. Another example is HIV. Now, since HIV destroys helper T cells, we can see the progression of the disease by monitoring the number of T cells in the blood. So if HIV is very active and actively destroying a lot of helper T cells. Obviously, you expect the number of helper T cells to be low. More severe, less T helper cells. 
Now this is another example, leukemia. This is quite an important example. It is a cancer of stem cells that produce white blood cells. And how do we know if the person has it? Now, we will know if we see an increase in white blood cell count. How strange is that, right? Cancer, more cells, right? Because it's due to uncontrolled mitosis. There's also a reduced production of white blood cells and platelets, which causes anemia and problems with blood clotting. Now, why is this the case? Why is it so weird? Now, first of all, again, cancer is due to uncontrolled mitosis. Therefore, you have an increase in white blood cell count. But isn't more white blood cells better? No, because first of all, it comes at the cost of reduced production of white blood cells and platelets. And second of all, white blood cells are not functioning properly. They are abnormal. They are, have cancer. So this causes the person having it to be immunosuppressed and more susceptible to infections. So, how do you know if the person has leukemia? Test for the proportion of white blood cells and white blood cells count. With our knowledge given, we can use this in endless more different diseases to diagnose them and to assess whether the treatment is working or not. And that's it from me. This is the end of part one. Have a good day. Bye.